the nurse pulls out a nice, sharp needle. She sterilizes your form and inserts the needle into a blood vessel. Beet red blood fills the collection tube. You'd come to the hospital for what you thought was simple jaw pain, but now you've left with a startling diagnosis. You have type 2 diabetes. Well, what do you do? You know that insulin or medication may be able to help. You also know that frequent visits to the physician would help you manage diabetes. However, you also know the reality of the situation. You have two kids back at home, and quite frankly, your current job really isn't cutting it. Healthcare just not a top priority for you. This was a common experience I had working as a community advocate in an emergency department that saw over 20,000 patients a year. Through many frank conversations with patients, I began to realize how many patients were in the emergency department for simple, preventable conditions. Many of these patients had skimped on years and years of frequent primary care visits and medications due to high cost. Well, the obvious question is, how can we remedy this? One popular solution has been universalized healthcare, where the government just pays for everyone's healthcare. However, there's two issues here. It is not simple, and it is not cheap. What we really need is to transform the way that we develop, provide, and finance healthcare. Allow me to introduce you to window shopping at the hospital. Imagine you could shop for healthcare, much like you do at an outlet mall, retail, or online. Much would be different. Companies like Starbucks, Amazon, and Walmart are subject to market forces. Basically, they put you, the consumer, in the executive's chair. You're the one who has the final say. However, these market forces really aren't present in healthcare. You often go to a hospital that is brand name in the region, but this brand name may or may not correlate with quality care. It is also difficult to educate yourself as a patient so that you can make an informed decision about your care. And to top it all off, you just really never know the price until it is too late. All of this leads to decreased cost, and as a result, a decreased competition, and as a result, increased cost. While it is difficult to subject our current healthcare system to market forces, some basic ideas such as pricing transparency, creating customer-obsessed organizations, and providing high-value care can help change this dynamic. Pricing transparency is a concept you're fairly familiar with. Whenever you go to like a Walmart or a Starbucks, you can see the price clearly listed, and you know what you're buying. You know the benefits and you know the features of the product or service. So now you know what you're buying and what, what you're getting and how much you're paying. However, in healthcare, sometimes the science will just fly right past you and it gets very confusing. And by the time you know it, you've paid ten or fifteen thousand dollars and you get that bill thirty days later. Despite this, pricing transparency isn't a novel concept in healthcare. In fact, it has been a topic of hot discussion and most recently required by the Centers of Medicaid and Medicare Services. Many pricing transparency opponents have stated that patients would be less likely to access care due to knowing the actual high prices of healthcare. However, this is because there currently isn't a market opening for a product or service that could accurately provide reflect, uh, price that is reflective of private dealings between physician groups, insurance, or uh, hospitals. However, it's just not enough to know the price as well. You need to know what you're buying. So such a service should also include ver uh, information such as variability of cost and quality between doctors and hospitals in the region. It also should include information such as, does this procedure significantly extend or improve quality of life? Creating such a cost ratio can help patients make informed decisions rather than fuzzy perceptions based on market market um, perceptions. This can help shift the market power from providers and payers back to the patients. Creating customer-obsessed organizations is another way we can help introduce market forces into the current system. Whenever you walk into Starbucks, you feel like you own it. You walk in and you have your Apple AirPods on, listening to your music, and you order a venti ice caramel macchiato, and you feel like you own it. At the end of the day, you've received a very high quality personalized drink and been treated with Starbucks royalty. In healthcare, we should feel confident in our caretakers and know 
that we have the opportunity to make informed decisions about our care. All of this should be packaged in a very patient-focused, patient-personalized manner. However, as you all may know, this is a bit far from reality in healthcare. This is because many healthcare managers have simply reviewed patient satisfaction as just reducing wait times. However, there is more to it. There needs to be more of a discussion towards improving the overall patient health, patient's journey through the healthcare system in a holistic manner. A lot of top organizations have recognized this need for change, and as a result, started to transform their organizations. These changes can be broken down into a couple of main ideas. First is that there needs to be a very strong patient focus. The patient is at the heart of everything that is done, and every employee has a direct responsibility to this patient. This patient focus needs to be so strong that perhaps organizations are willing to provide refund for co-pays for patients who've had unsatisfactory care. Second is that we need to utilize models that have worked well in other industries, especially retail. Utilizing real-time feedback, actionable data, and historic data in historic trends, we can personalize the patient experience. And finally, is something I'd like to call the McDonald's Happy Meal Toy Experience. Whenever you go to McDonald's, you get a little Happy Meal toy with it. I don't know about you guys, but I go because of the Happy Meal toy. <laughs> but whatever it is, it keeps me happy, keeps me satisfied, and it keeps me coming. In healthcare, this could utilize, be utilized very well in elective procedures or elective surgery as a fringe benefit. Perhaps we could provide patients with free transportation or free grocery deliveries so that patients can recuperate quickly and get back to doing what matters the most to them. However, as you may know, these changes just won't happen overnight. There needs to be support from the finance, financing aspect as well. The financing aspect can be broken down into investors and leaders, strategy, and government involvement. Investors and leaders who are involved in healthcare should be involved for the long term, not the short term. People who are activist investors, who are there just for the short term and high returns, shouldn't be involved in healthcare, as the reality is, Behind every dollar in healthcare, there's a patient's life at stake, and it just simply shouldn't be played with. Keeping a long-term focus and pa long-term patient focus with our investors and leaders can really help lead this change. However, just saying all of this doesn't mean anything. You need to act upon it. The strategy needs to work directly in a long-term patient-focused manner. Strategy that is focused on mergers and acquisitions, basically just consolidating companies together isn't necessarily the best strategy for healthcare. It creates a lot of false sense of busyness that a lot of things are going on, but the reality is just financing and integ integration is the main portion. There isn't a strong focus on the patient improvement of patient quality or cost, and that actually is reflected. Often, after big mergers and acquisitions, patient quality, goes, quality for patients goes down and costs go up. And finally, we need to decrease government involvement in healthcare. The government just isn't able to provide the proper nudges that market forces are able to do. This ends up leading to the wrong incentives. And for example, a lot of low-performing organizations are kept alive just because it will save a couple of jobs and it's a great political move. But in the end, we all end up paying. But you just simply can't get rid of all of government either. It's kind of like dodgeball in the gym. If you have too many rules in dodgeball, someone's leaving home with a black eye. But if you have zero, if you have, if you have too many rules, then no, no one's gonna, no one's gonna play anymore. Finally, price, uh, providing high value care or getting the most bang for our buck can also help introduce market forces into the current system. Whenever you walk into Starbucks, do you pay separately for someone to go grab the beans, go dry them out, go roast them, grind them? <laughs> no, no, you just pay for the final drink. In healthcare, however, you currently act like the accounting department. You receive bills from the doctor's office, the surgeon's office, the anesthesiologist's office, and just gets very hectic and confusing. And it's very inefficient as well. Hopefully in the future, these payments will be consolidated through globalized or bundled payments, and these payments will be into a sing pay uh, combined into a single payment that is spread across maybe a diseases or treatments or therapies. It also will be, it hopefully, it will also be that these, these uh, globalized payments will be bundled in forms of value, a value that is reflective of patient-focused metrics and 
of overall health of a population. This would incentivize pre, uh, doctors and organizations who are actively improving the quality of their care. And this will help for us to lower our costs that are reflective of value. As we wrap up today, let's go back to our window shopping imagery. There are many surface distractions that just pull us in many directions. Let's push aside these surface distractions and focus on the core economic forces that influence our decisions. While there are many touch points that could improve our healthcare system, the question still begs to be answered. Will we continue to look for simple political fixes to the current system or critically think and understand the economic forces behind healthcare? Well, I'll leave that one up to you guys to answer. Thank you.